Hello, this is Ron Powell, and you're listening to Fast Forward on the World Transformed. This program presents ongoing conversations with thought leaders who are shaping our future through new ideas and new technologies. In this edition of Fast Forward, Dave Schrader talks with us about the unexpected relationship between business analytics and sports analytics. What does the world of sports have to teach us about doing business in the age of digitization and data-driven business models? Let's explore The Future Begins right now. Live to see it, friends, and welcome to the World Transformed. I'm Phil Bowermaster, and I'm pleased to introduce our very special guest for today's Fast Forward program. With a PhD in computer science from Purdue, Dave Schrader, known to many as Dr. Dave, has managed engineering and marketing functions at three high-tech companies within the analytics and database field, most recently at Teradata. He serves on the board of directors for the Teradata University Network, also known as TUN, which is a free resource with 5,000 faculty and 12,000 student participants. Dave is best known for his role as an advocate for sports analytics. Last year alone, he gave 59 talks on the subject at 32 different universities, reaching more than 2,200 students. He's currently launching a series of Moneyball-inspired campus projects in which students apply their math, stats, and computer science skills to real projects, often from their own school's athletic departments. Dave, welcome to the show. Thank you. Well, uh, we're really pleased to have you with us today. Let's start out maybe with some background, how you got into all this. How does an analytics guru from the business world become an expert in sports analytics? Well, when I was working at Teradata, I often would help out the Teradata University Network a uh, ton outreach effort by giving talks to universities wherever I was traveling. So when I retired in 2014, they asked me if I would um, continue to do that. At the time, I was giving a lot of big data talks, which of course were very popular with faculty and university people. And then I decided to branch out and learn a new area of sports analytics. At one of the board meetings, I brought up the idea of doing that, and we actually voted, and 12 out of 12 faculty said, oh yeah, if you do that, we would love to hear about that too. So one of the faculty members on the board from the University of Virginia highly recommended that I attend the MIT Sloan School Sports Analytics Conference, which I had no idea it was 3,000 people in Boston every February or early March. And I ended up attending um, the 2015, 16, 17, and 18 conferences where I met a lot of interesting people. Typically, there are a lot of panels, so it might include a pro player, a pro coach, uh, an ESPN uh, talking head, and maybe a, uh, an expert blogger, uh, stats person on that area. I also read a lot of research papers on the Internet. and also exploited some of my personal connections. We'll talk about that a little bit later to debrief people and come up with ideas. So in the course of the past four years, I've been invited to very good schools, a wide variety of big schools, small schools, private schools, public schools. Uh, through that, I often get linked to their athletic department. So I've managed to talk to coaches, trainers at places like Oklahoma State, Auburn, Notre Dame. And I, I um, thought I could help them because I see a lot of parallels between the world of analytics for business and the world of analytics for sports. And then that kind of led to the money ball kind of idea of doing campus projects. Dave, uh, money ball was one of my favorite books by Michael Lewis. Uh, you know how Billy Bean uh, revolutionized Major League Baseball by utilizing saber metrics with the Oakland A's. You know, it's a book uh, I have recommended to a lot of people in, in, in the movie if uh, people are interested in reading the book. But, but let's explore the thinking behind the Money Ball projects. Why would doing a project in sports analytics be anything other than a recreational exercise for these students? Well, it turns out 
in the business schools where I originally started giving a lot of my talks, there are many parallels, especially if you take a look at the area of, of fan management. So every sports organization has the front office business ops people that focus on things like how do we set ticket prices or how do we uh, get encourage people to renew their uh, season tickets, how do we do promotions to get individual game tickets to sell out. Um, so while they call it fan management, it's customer management, CRM 101, and all of those techniques that we know in the business world of how to market to fans, how to price products. You know, Pricing of airline seats has been done for a good 25 years. Uh, a lot of the Teradata customers like American and United have done that for a long, long time. And, and there are a lot of different factors that go into how do you price things. Well, same kind of things, uh, 20 different factors might contribute to what causes people to pay different prices for individual game seats. So the, um, the analytical techniques are identical, and so it's not a, a huge amount of a stretch. Similarly, the phone companies all try to analyze who's going to renew or not renew at end of your phone contract. Well, that's, that collection of techniques is no different from renewing season tickets. So it's pretty easy to do, but far more exciting for the students. It's interesting. When you come right down to it, even at the collegiate level, sports is a business, isn't it? Oh, absolutely. And every school is trying to you know, maximize the number of fans that show up, including for the non-revenue sports, although most of the focus would be on the revenue sports since they're trying to cover the cost. You, know, you always hear about the big schools like Alabama or Notre Dame where the amount of money that they bring in exceeds the, uh, and helps pay for all the non-revenue sports, but a lot of schools are underwater. So it's important that they have good analytical techniques to try to encourage people to come to their games. I'm sure. So can you give us an example of one of the projects that you did? What, what kind of things did they get into? <clears throat> yeah, I actually was skiing a while ago, and I used to live in Colorado Springs. One of my friends said, hey, do you want to go over and meet the Mountain West Conference Commissioner? So I talked to uh, Dan Butterly for basketball and Jamie Hickson for football. And Jamie wanted to do a project to understand the attendance patterns at the 12 schools in the Mountain West Conference. For people that might not know, that would include everybody from Hawaii, San Diego State, San Jose State, through the western states to uh, University of Wyoming, University of New Mexico, and the Air Force Academy. So it... Um, it was a very interesting project. We're wrapping it up right now. They gave us five years of fan data for every football game for every school and the attendance turnstile data. And we did a first project last fall with two groups of three uh, Notre Dame students to build regression models to try to pick out the important factors. There are a lot of things that would go into who shows up for games. So for individual game seats, one hypothesis would be that the weather would matter. If it's really hot at University of Nevada, Las Vegas, because it's an August game, did that hurt attendance compared to games later in the year? On the other hand, it might be really cold in Wyoming or Air Force Academy in November. So you, we are trying to pick out what drives attendance. Weather could be one of many factors, clearly whether you're on a roll, momentum, if you won your last three games, or if it's a rivalry game, all of those are the kind of factors that we could pick out. Anyway, we did a four-week project with Notre Dame. That got the commissioners and the athletic directors that they read out the models to very excited. So um, they wanted to know if this spring we could do another project. I wrote a note to the connections that I had at three of their schools, Colorado State, Air Force Academy, and UNLV. Within one hour, two faculty members from the Air Force Academy called up and said, we'll do the project. And I said, that's great. How many students can you put on it to create fan models for these different schools? And they said, you can have our whole class, 24 cadets. So that's what we're wrapping up right now. Wow. So obviously a lot of enthusiasm for this kind of thing. And I think that's a great example because when you talk about fan analytics, I don't think that's 
the kind of data people typically think of when they think of sports analytics. There's, that it's actually a much broader area than we tend to realize. So could you step us through maybe some of the different kinds of analysis that's being done? Well, there are actually five areas. I don't know that that's the right number, but it's the uh, collection of areas that I kind of put everything into. So we have the fan area, and then um, an area between the front office, the business people, and in particular the finance people plus the coaches would be roster construction. Often when I give talks, I ask if people are doing fantasy football, and that's all about how do you pick out the right sets of players. So you can do predictive models based on a variety of data points on who you want to have on your team, or another variation of that would be when you get to the coaching level, team tactics. So if it's basketball, who are you going to put on the court given who you're up against? especially late in the game, who do you follow, things like that. Team tactics can include things like what's the next play going to be if we're talking about football. So um, you have that as the third area. The fourth area would be health and safety. That's working with the trainers and the coaches on how are you going to keep people safe, everything from concussion, uh, predictive models and analytics to uh, recovery time for injuries. And then um, league analytics are a big area too. So in addition to every team, for example, in the NBA, the National Basketball Association, you have 35 people at their New York City headquarters that are trying to maximize revenues for the whole league as opposed to individual games. And what's interesting on sports, we usually think of the teams as competing like crazy, and that's true at the tactical level and the coaching level, but it is not a zero-sum game when it comes to the revenue. So there are actually like many conferences where people share best practices on analytics for uh, driving fans since it's usually home and away games. Interesting. So if we take that list of five, why don't we work through those one by one? We already talked a little bit about fan analysis before, but do you have any other examples you'd want to share? Sure. On the fan side, in addition to what I talked about, I'm going to start up a project on donor analytics. So a lot of the high-powered schools have alumni, and in addition to getting people to donate on the academic side and use predictive models for where to focus your attention, um, many of them, I was over at UCLA, have things like the John Wooden Foundation, and the idea is that um, people have to pay almost like a country club membership to to get the best season ticket. So um, within the athletic department, schools have people that are focused on which fans are going to donate either to the university or the athletic department, how much, what kind of incentives do they give those people to donate, what are the predictive drivers. So I think donor analytics will be interesting because every school has a development office. So even if it's not sports, we could have business school or computer or stats kids working on donor analytics to help out their own development groups. So you mentioned roster construction, uh, Dave. Is, is that who they're going to draft? Yeah, we just went through the draft recently here for um, football, but it's a very wide area. So um, students, of course, are very interested in fantasy sports, and you know that's a, a very interesting area. I don't personally get into that, but I can give students papers, and there are a number of uh, students I know at Carnegie Mellon and Stanford that have uh, tried to analyze that problem. And, so just giving the students access to some of the data points that I know. Um, the variation that I'm most interested in right now, because I found a really great paper, and then I, I met with the PhD student doing the work and her two faculty advisors. And that's a project to um, try to figure out which high school athletes you're going to give scholarships to. So. Um, her unique approach was to use social media data. After high school kids go to uh, meet with coaches on campus, often they tweet about it. And that tweet data is public 
sourced information along with the scholarship offer information from a variety of schools to any particular athlete, which you can find on 24-7 sports. So she built some predictive models to augment the traditional techniques that they use to try to figure out is someone going to accept a scholarship offer to add the social media data, things like did the coach follow that student athlete? Did the student athlete follow the coach? Does he follow other athletes that he met while he was on campus? Does he use the hashtag for that school? And she found that she could predict with about 70% accuracy if a student was going to accept a scholarship. So um, I think that's a very uh, easy to do project. Uh, she said not many schools are doing that kind of thing. It's the kind of thing where I don't think the athletic department staff is going to be able to do it on their own, but if the business school students did a project like that, I think they would uh, perceive it as very high value. You know, it just goes to show there is data everywhere, and there's info oh, yeah. to, be, to, to be gleaned from that data everywhere. It's, a, it's really amazing. And that, and that kind of takes us to the next one, which is team tactics, not something I would have off the top of my head thought of as something that there would be a lot of statistical analysis around. To talk about how that works a little bit. This is an area, I would label this area as the one that's in the greatest state of flux. And the reason is traditionally, uh, how do coaches take a look at planning for uh, an upcoming opponent? The answer is video. And uh, we're moving from a world of just doing game cut-ups. If we stick with football, there's uh, popular two popular systems that are cloud-based are Huddle and Exos. And the idea is after a game, traditionally, the old way would be that the assistant coaches that they're cutting up a game into little snippets, video snippets, then they start annotating everything, like what down was it, where was the ball located, uh, what was the planned play, uh, what was the outcome, did you give up explosive plays. So. Um, we took one small problem there, and we got huddle data, uh, thanks to my nephew who works at the University of Dubuque, introduced me to their defensive coordinator who gave me access to six years' worth of data. And I wanted students to analyze the data. I didn't have University of Dubuque students, so I asked permission from the coach to give the data to Oklahoma State students who were uh, all part of the Teradata University network and had just learned how to do Sankey diagrams. So we applied that technology to predicting what play is coming next. And they built things like cascaded decision tree model. So you drop um, the context into the model and then it predicts whether the next play is going to be a run or a pass. Um, it turned out there were four levels uh, or three levels to the model with four different factors. And that cascaded decision tree model was 75% accurate on predicting whether the next play was going to be a run or a pass. So that's the old way. The new way is to either put sensors on the players, which is what the NFL has been doing the last two years, and they kick out about two uh, I think 2 million data points per game. Or you can try to use video analytics technologies, machine learning techniques, um, to try to map directly from the game film with no human intervention into dots on a Cartesian coordinate plane. And once you do that kind of thing, dots moving around on a plane, now you can start applying geometry algorithms to the areas of making and breaking space. Or you can start measuring things like how fast are people running, or are people slowing down in the fourth quarter? Maybe a defender you know, is either out of position, the geometry problem, or he's slowing down, he's fatigued. So all of that are, uh, makes for very interesting research problems. Boy, it almost sounds putting sensors on players. It almost sounds like we're going to have uh, robots playing pretty soon. What do you think about that? Uh, yeah, robot football. I've thought about that a little bit. But actually, it's not that new an idea because that, that gets us into the fourth area. Chances are one of you has a Fitbit, right? Right. Oh, yeah. So you're measuring steps per day you're starting to track it. And all of those techniques are the fourth area of health and safety. So 
everything's getting instrumented. For example, there are app-connected weightlifting machines. So now instead of paper and pen or you know, all the position players do the same weightlifting routine, you can do segment of one lifting protocols. Um, there are vest technologies like Zephyr or Catapult that will measure your heart rate, your respiration rate, and be able to help uh, automatically connect with trainers so, no, so that you know if you're, you know, stressing people enough that that will help them be in peak position for the game, but you don't want to overtrain people either. So a lot of data is being kicked out there. One of the most interesting talks I saw a couple years ago was the um, person from Gatorade that was talking about next generation Gatorade. The way that would work is uh, everybody loses electrolytes at a different rate. So if I were to uh, instrument you guys by putting a patch on you and working you until you sweat, we pull off the patch, read it out, and then that unique combination of electrolytes would cause maybe Ron gets a blue coating and, and Phil gets a yellow coating, and there would be things that look like K-cups, the um, customized little things that you have for coffee machines. So we would put a blue one in your Gatorade bottle, puncture it, shake it up, uh, Ron, and then it's instrumenting uh, not only your combination, but how often do you drink? So it's a hot August day. We're getting ready for a game. It knows for your height, weight, position, and stress levels how much you should be drinking. And if, it, if you're not drinking enough, then it will phone home to the trainer scoreboard on his laptop. So that's what's coming from Gatorade. In, in general, what we want to do is build a 360-degree view of every athlete, just like traditionally in business, we do a 360-degree view of every customer. And then you can tailor practice intensity to your particular needs, including uh, taking into account any injuries that you've had and recovery times. What I see are a lot of analogies here between things like you know, uh, the instrumentation and the failure analytics for things like locomotives or uh, airplanes or jet engines and the aging functions. And we call them Weibull diagrams um, for things like aircraft engine failure, but you can apply that to aging athletes. And for any particular skill position, any particular sport, there are fairly well-known peak performance graphs which provide useful information on when to start um, getting concerned about someone getting older and not being able to hit the ball as well. Reaction time starts slowing down. Um, so it, it's really just the Internet of Things is being applied to health and safety. Um, one other example just to close out this area would be what's the impact of a factor like sleep? It turns out at Stanford they did some experiments with their basketball team, swimmers, some other sports, and they found that um, just getting 10 hours of bed rest per day, which I think college kids would love to hear that they're required to be in bed 10 hours a day, uh, without devices, hopefully, except for the instrumentation devices. Anyway, it, it, for basketball, it improved both their sprint times and their three-point and free throw percentages by 9%. So. Um, that was a very interesting study that certainly gets the attention of coaches and trainers because it's very easy to do. So, so many variables to keep track of there. That's really that's that's really amazing. And I just want to clarify on that example you gave earlier. We were we were tracking how often Ron is drinking Gatorade, right? So <laughs> exactly. <laughs> of course, he's drinking Gatorade. Yeah, not not because he gives else. him this because he gives him this competitive edge, right? Yeah, exactly. I just wanted to clarify that on Ron's behalf there. Okay, so finally, the, the last one you mentioned was league analytics. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Well, I already mentioned the Mountain West Conference example that we did with Notre Dame and Air Force Academy. Another one actually came through the University of Dubuque. A guy named John McGovern came up to me and introduced himself as a wrestling coach, but he and I thought, oh, my God, I don't know anything about wrestling. Maybe we can do force models or 3D uh, models. <laughs> you know, I, my brain was racing. But it turned out the problem that he wanted to work, wanted me to help with, and, and he was fun to listen to. It was like, can you do math on a problem for me? 
And the problem was really a tournament layout problem. The problem is pretty easy to state. There are 105 schools in Division Three wrestling, and they group them into six regions at the end of the year when they start uh, going towards the national championships. So you have to make it through the regions, and there are 10 weight classes. Three um, guys get out of that and go to nationals for each weight class. So, um, so. The goal is to divide the 105 schools roughly into an equal number of schools per region, and then the power of each region should be balanced. So you don't want to put all the really strong schools in one region, but on the other hand, you want to minimize the driving time because they do not have big budgets. So that's the problem. 105 schools divided into six regions such that when you sum up the power of the schools in each region, the regions are roughly balanced, and the driving time maybe to the center of each region is minimized. Um, although I could have done the work, I ended up recruiting five schools and, and faculty members and students there to help with the project. So um, the NCAA does not tell you what their power ratings are. So it turned out there was a former wrestler who's a faculty member teaching stats at the University of Cincinnati who built the power models. and then. I pitched the project when I was giving talks and had four schools sign up to uh, compete. So we had a little bit of a competition to come up with the best algorithm, Purdue, Notre Dame, Wright State in Dayton, Ohio, and Bentley in Waltham, Massachusetts worked on it. And uh, they came up with four different styles of clustering alg algorithms to uh, come up with a, a better solution than what they were doing. The best one turned out to be the genetic algorithm from the head of the math department at Bentley University. And we're giving that back to the NCAA. Well, that, that is so intriguing. I, I had no idea that analytics applied to sports had so many different areas. Uh, Dave, uh, how do you keep the ball rolling? I mean, how are you getting the word out? Uh, how are you getting these... Uh, you know, these students doing these projects. Uh, how do you go about that? Well, it used to be that I was invited on campus to give the big data talks, and then usually I'd give one uh, sports analytics talk. I called it the entering the golden age of analytics. And those became very popular. In fact, almost every school where I gave that talk, they invited me back. And the second and third years, I started pushing hard for doing what I call a money ball on campus day. So it turns out it's almost a formula. The three key meetings are a coaching clinic, usually at 8 in the morning because they're morning people for coaches and trainers. And the idea is to provide value to them by educating them on what the state of the art is, what the pros are doing, and what leading college teams are doing. Sometimes that makes them very nervous. At many schools, I almost scare them into opening up their data sets to other parts of the university. I don't really need to touch the data myself, but students and faculty on their own campus could help them. And I give them a lot of examples with the idea of linking up the athletic department with their own, their own people and creating capstone projects. I was at Bryant University this spring um, doing that kind of thing. And I ended up spending an extra day coming up with 11 different student capstone projects, uh, including the things like the Twitter analysis for uh, recruiting. That gets coaches usually pretty interesting. So the idea of the coaching clinic is to get the coaches and trainers sufficiently interested that they would be willing to do one of these projects with their own students. The second meeting, usually over lunch, especially if food's provided, gets the faculty members to show up to understand that there are interesting research problems that they could work on and publish and open up the eyes of the faculty to some of these research problems, which often are not a big stretch from what they're already doing. So it may be marketing people who are already doing CRM, customer relationship management, research projects, and now we apply it to fans or we apply it to donors. So getting them up to date is um, a second part of the formula. And then student talks there are never the problem at Bryant. I think we had 390 people pack the auditorium for the Moneyball talk. Um, 
the entering the the you know golden age of analytics with a big line of students afterwards who wanted to projects. So I, I think the interesting thing here is athletic departments usually have been isolated and off on one part of the campus with very little interaction with the rest of the people on campus. I guess my view would be let's start treating the athletic department like a lab environment of filled with interesting problems and data sets that um, the students who are studying analytics in the business school and computer science and stats can then leverage and, and help do things like drive more people to come to games, especially uh, the non-revenue sports. Usually attendance there isn't very good, but you could launch some CRM marketing campaigns and give the business school students some real experience. Well, it's a fantastic idea. I can, I can see why students get enthusiastic about it because it is inherently a bunch of interesting problems. You've got real data, and it's something close to them, something they can really have an impact on in their own world, right? I mean, that's a that's a that's a wonderful thing. So, are there other uh, projects that you currently have going that are similar to that, or uh, t take a different approach? Yeah, one area that I've been pitching recently, um, we haven't kicked any of them off, but there was an award-winning talk a year ago that I keep thinking about from RPI Rensselaer Polytechnic in Troy, New York, and. It's just heartwarming would be the right way to put it. Over a five-year period, they've been running basketball camps for at-risk youth. And what they do is pair the students up. So while one student is doing basketball drills and shooting, the other one is standing there annotating shot locations on the court and calculating completion percentages and entering the data into a database and using visualization tools to build charts and graphs. So one kid shoots, the other one does the analytics work, and then they switch, and the other student does the same thing. So what, what's very interesting is the outcome now that they're five years into it is that some of these kids that hadn't thought about going to college are actually going to college, and even more interesting, some of them are becoming math majors. So it's a way to pair up sports and analytics in a very practical way with a wonderful result. Oh, that's really heartwarming, and it really gives back to the community. I mean, what amazing results you're having there. Uh, you know, David, it's really been a pleasure uh, talking with you today about uh, sports analytics. Yep, and hopefully, you know, some of your listeners have connections with universities. Uh, can point them to the Teradata University Network. If people want me to come on campus, I'm happy to do that. I'm retired, so I have plenty of free time. And, and I actually have done it worldwide. I did want to mention um, a couple of years ago, I went to Germany and talked to four different German universities. Of course, they only are interested in one sport, right? Fußball. Soccer, I guess. Yeah. Fußball, 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 fußball. <laughs> and, um, but, but there, just like the other sports that we talked about, um, instrumenting the players, being able to track making and breaking space. It's all about what they call triangles in soccer. So who's defending well, who's making space by pulling a defender out of position. All of the problems are the very same ones. So there are good international opportunities too. I did have one Chinese faculty member that asked me when I was going to do ping pong analytics. <laughs> I thought that was fun. I don't know that the sensors are going to be able to be small enough that they don't impact the ball, so we probably have to use video analytics on that particular example. As long as we can get that ping pong data, that's the key. As long as you can get that's that data. That's right. Getting data is always the key starting point. You can do that analytics. Well, thank you again, Dave. It's great having you with us, and I do hope that we hear about some additional projects. Maybe we'll have you back on uh, somewhere down the road and talk about this further. Sure, that would be great. All right, well, that is going to have to do it for this edition of Fast Forward on the World Transformed. My thanks to Ron Powell and our special thanks once again to Dave Schrader for being with us today. And thank you all for listening. We hope you'll join us again as we continue to explore a future that is unfolding before us in unexpected ways and at a breathtaking pace. And until next time, Live to see it. To learn more about Dave Schrader and academic projects and analytics, visit TerradataUniversityNetwork.com. To learn more about this program, visit WorldTransformed.com. Thank you all for listening.